friendly. We interrupt for an important bulletin. A deadly high-speed pursuit between police and armed gunmen is underway traveling northbound on San Pablo Avenue. <laughs> So early on in this film, we just get such a great vibe for what it's gonna feel like. The score for The Incredibles was written by Michael Giacchino, who you may remember we just recently talked about when we discussed another one of his films, Rogue One. So if you saw that video, you'll know that one thing that Michael is amazing at is drawing these influences from either previous works or just different types of music that aid in making the film feel exactly how it needs to feel at any given time. And here in The Incredibles, we see the exact same thing immediately. Now, one thing that you, we obviously can hear are the influences from spy movies since they became a thing. I mean, James Bond, the Mission Impossible series. This film, being a Pixar film, has an element of fun and comedy to it while being a superhero movie and a spy movie all at the same time. So I think immediately we hear that with such a, what normally would be a very serious thing of somebody running from the cops and shooting at them. But instead we see this badass reveal of Mr. Incredible and the whole transforming the car into this epic Batmobile type looking thing. It's fun, it's crazy, it's a Pixar movie, it's what we expect and the music perfectly goes with that. It's amazing how something as simple as a pause can have such an effect. The music is pivotal in causing you to feel that sort of blank moment where you're like, oh, now this has to happen, and the music just cutting out for that split second, but kind of still in time. It's like just a measure of silence there. Really puts us exactly where we need to be for the next part of the scene. movie in so many years I forgot how amazing it is. Let's take a look at this track, The Glory Days by Michael Giacchino, this first track, the opener to this movie, and man is it an opening. Check this out. So already, um, we're starting off with this very serious hero vibe. A perfect fifth, for some reason, is like our go-to with strong superhero action, that just type of genre. There's a reason why we call it a power chord, because it the frequency rub of the first and the fifth of the scale together, because it's the next smoothest frequency after an octave. Obviously an octave, so if you were to break it down and look at like the frequency wave between notes, a good way to imagine is to listen to the notes combined and hear how quickly or slowly the waves are. So for example, if I play an octave, very smooth, right? Just a very smooth line. But if I play a minor second, hear that go, right? The wave would, more, it would look more like that. Every interval, that's a little smoother, but still pretty, it's, there's still a good rub going on there. This is what dissonance basically is, by the way. It's, it's the combination of frequencies in such a way that it creates a rub, and our ears kind of hear it as this uh, friction, almost, in, in frequency. When we're looking at different intervals, every interval has its own frequency wave, and the fifth happens to be the next smoothest one after... So this is extremely smooth, because it's the same note, just separated by an octave. But now if we go to the fifth, that's still really smooth. They go together so well. Very little rubbing going on there, you know? A little more once you get into the lower registers of the piano. It's such a strong interval. Dig that piano in the beginning there. So here it almost feels like we're taking a little bit of a page out of the Mission Impossible theme. Like, check this out. a similar thing going on here. You know what I mean? For some reason this seems to be a thing. Minor, major, seven chords, right? So minor chord, 
with a major seven. This is like classic sound, James Bond, Mission Impossible, like we hear a lot of this minor major seven sound just because it has this sort of mysteriousness to it, like a alarming sound to it, like, Oh no! Here's an interesting question. Let me know in the comments below because I'm curious to see what your thoughts are on this. Do we think of this stuff as like, oh, this is the sound of a spy movie? Is it because somehow the chords and the intervals match the feeling of a lot of those films or a lot of, you know, what we would expect a spy situation to kind of feel like? Or is it just something that somebody made a decision back in, you know, when the James Bond films were maybe first being uh, being written that, oh, this kind of this kind of sounds cool and mysterious. And like, now we just know that sound to be related to spy movies. Is it nature or nurture? Let me know in the comments below because I'm curious about your thoughts. Hey, and just before we continue, I want to let you guys know that if you haven't already checked it out, there is a brand new course up on the Cornell Music Academy. It's an improvisation course. Some of you may have checked it out on Skillshare, but if you have, here's what's new. This improv course contains tons of actionable steps and exercises that you can work on at home on your own piano in addition to all of the lectures and all of the information and the lessons. It's available right now on the Cornell Music Academy which if you haven't checked out yet please please go do that's hands down the absolute best way you guys can support the channel and I'm so grateful to all of you who have gone to check it out so far we're having a great time over there there's a link in the description down below. You know one cool thing that I learned about the recording of this soundtrack is that it was actually recorded in analog it was not digital and everyone was in the same room a super old style which was something that they specifically wanted to achieve with the sound. Again, probably alluding to that sort of early James Bond, some of the old Mission Impossible stuff. And I think Michael Cicchino has it right when he says that the right way to record is with everyone together in the same room, especially when it's this specific type of music. There are certainly plenty of applications where tracking things in makes the most sense and can get the best result, but with big band, this, this sort of jazz-based spy movie thriller kind of vibe, like, yeah, you want the whole band together just performing this stuff live in a room and get it on tape. There's that minor major seven chord. Woo, wait a second. the trumpets are in uh, major seconds there. Like we were talking about before, the dissonance, the rub of those frequencies, this is a very dissonant moment in the film where he's fighting the Omnidroid for the first time. We want lots of we want lots of dissonance, lots of crunch, lots of like, ah, something's not right here. If the harmony was just this nice, you know, chord or whatever, like it would not, it wouldn't make you feel in a panic. It wouldn't make you feel uneasy like something's wrong. So it's got to match. Lots of minor seconds, lots of trills and... Ah, yes, so this is what is super cool about cinematic movie scores. You have a theme, you have a, um, in this case, it's the... That shows up everywhere, even in places where it doesn't match the original vibe. Sometimes we'll see a theme show up in like a love theme, in a romantic part that's much quieter, much slower, but yet we're still using a melody that's from a much more intense part of the movie. These themes get repurposed all throughout the score and it's part of what draws everything together and gives every film its own unique feel. That is just such an awesome section. And we hear a bunch of things, including... Which is reminiscent of that original theme like we were just talking about. Here's another place where these influences come into play. Think about the James Bond theme. Right, so we see a lot of this... James Bond, we would keep going to the natural sixth, flat sixth, five, right? While being its own brilliant original composition, Michael Giacchino clearly did his homework and referenced so many of these incredible scores that we have from similar themed films in the past. The 
this is another one of those great examples that shows just the sheer width of emotion that this score can invoke. I mean, it's 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 so drastically different from the intense action scenes to this thing that feels like it's just like a throwback. And you basically have a big band chart here that sounds a lot like a standard. It's just incredible to see the... <laughs> I SAID IT! Sorry, I won't do it again. Ah. Ah, hear that little piano in the background? Oh. Ah, I like, there's a little bit of... There's a little 5-1 in there, not much, a little bit. Yeah, wow, what is just a pretty... minor, in, uh, sort of implying the G, but not really changing our root. We're kind of sitting on that D minor for the whole thing. And it just creates a really, really nice pad to play on. These gorgeous string flourishes and, oh man, it's just, really is a great example of just stacking third. Restraint is, is always is always good. Let's go let's go with that. It would be so easy to sit here and go through this entire soundtrack because all of it is incredible, but fortunately we do not have time for that. I'm curious to know your guys' favorite parts of the soundtrack below in the comments, so let me know. And let me know if there's other stuff that you want me to cover from The Incredibles or any other Pixar film. We haven't really dug into Pixar very much, and there is so much good music to be discussed. So let me know what you want to hear next. And as always, thank you so much for watching this video, and we will see you next time.